record. Hi there, this is Craig Stevens, and I have with me Ann and Patricia, and we're the Change Mentors. We've talked about all kinds of wonderful subjects, and we're really prepared today to talk about training adults. And so, P Patricia, you kind of gave it away. You, you laughed when I said we're really prepared. <laughs> <laughs> we had this discussion right before. So what are we talk about today? I said, don't you guys remember? We put it top of our list and then we're all in the same boat. None of us have, uh, none of us really remember the, the subject for today, but it is how to train adults. And so we're going to ask each other questions and we're going to go through it because we got at least a couple of years. Well, how many years of training have you done, Patricia? I'm not telling. <laughs> I'm, go I'm going for one. One year. Been, All right. So, and lying you're gonna... about my age too long. Yeah. So I don't yeah. want to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. I have been training for at least 30 years, maybe. Okay. So... Well, I'll go along with that. Yeah, okay. me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to count when I was you. an adjunct instructor, then that was oh, around my no 20s. <laughs> 20s so that was, so that that was 20 so that's was about uh 10 years ago so that makes it 50 <laughs> yeah, yeah i think so in 30. No, 30, 30 and 30 yeah so it, so it was 40 years if you want to count that i guess did, did you uh, ever did you ever teach math because i i don't think <laughs> i teach math now i teach optimization theories oh no Ooh, the education Anne, world's in trouble. I taught statistics, <laughs> Anne. I uh -oh. teach math. <laughs> All right. Well, well that's you fine. know you can Just any fine. you can create any statistic you want to prove anything that you want. Right so. on, Anne. Bravo. <laughs> that's a good comeback. <laughs> Did you know that 75% of statistics is all made up? But I just made oh. that up. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so that was part of the 75 and yeah. and oh, mine is God. probably a little higher than that but that's okay <laughs> all right so let's see if we were to uh now why are we interested in this Anne? because that was one of the big points you wanted to make last time why are we interested in even talking about training i'll let you think about that while i go into the introduction a little bit um and i'll give you a hint we do a lot of training Anne. okay <laughs> A hint. We do a lot of training. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. If we were to break down training, I think a good way we might be able to think of it is kind of like change management. It's there's a before the training starts, there's the during the training, and there's the after training. So before the training starts could be all the way up from months or even years. <laughs> If you're trying to put together material, like, like sometimes we do, we spend a lot of time putting together material and then, uh, and then we actually meet for the first time, the first group, and I'm not going to talk about the marketing yet. So let's, let's talk about when you first meet people, right? When you first meet people, then there's, what's the first thing you do? And it's, there's some kind of icebreaker that goes on, right? So uh, Patricia, think about one of the, your favorite icebreakers. And I'll give you an example of one of mine while you're thinking. Um, so one thing I used to do is I used to get two people paired together and I would say, okay, you're gonna introduce the other person. You're gonna tell us two very interesting facts about their life. So you gotta get to know them. And then you're gonna make something up and you're gonna let us guess which one's the made up one and which is the most interesting. So I'm trying to get them to tell something really, something about themselves that they have never told anybody else. And it's what's the strange thing about it is oftentimes people can't guess because this, the facts that, in, that are in their life are often stranger than the made up one that someone's trying to throw in. And so, but I've had people introduce the other person with a couple of facts and then say, she's also, and they go into something that's really unusual. Patricia, what, have you thought of anything as an icebreaker? Well, I just was thinking of an exact experience that I had in one of my workshops. I had everybody, it was a, a female workshop, women, 
And um, I did not tell them any task. I said, did everybody bring your high heel shoe? And they said, yes. And I said, okay, go over there to that table and decorate your shoe. So I didn't tell them anything except decorate their shoe. And there were all kinds of things over there. And the first next thing I noticed, they were all talking. Do you want these beads? Um, you know, a feather would be great on. So they started talking to each other. And by the time we got back over to our chairs to sit down and start the process of learning, everybody already knew everybody. And what they what we did that point was introduce our shoe, but it was really about who we were and not necessarily the shoe. So everybody ended up saying, well, I thought this is who you were. I, so it started a conversation that was not about training. It was about just coming together and um, not knowing what you're supposed to do, but just walking into each other, so. Very good. Yeah. Um, Patricia, did you think of any, uh, not Patricia, Ann, another other Patricia, Ann, did you think, <laughs> Did you think of anything while we're here? Well, yeah. And I wanted to say that even with children, because that's my audience, generally speaking, I have uh, an icebreaker for them where we take different colored candies. And if you, you just pick a candy out of a dish, and if you get a red candy, then you have to tell where's your favorite place to go or what's your favorite thing to do? Or I have five different questions and for each color candy, they have to answer a question. So the kids start learning about each other as a group. And then we do breakout sessions where they have to find out the other four questions uh, just between themselves. So it helps yeah. them to better understand how to do that. And you'd be surprised how difficult that seems to be for them when they're young. Um, but it works. It works very well. And they get to eat candy. So they're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like an excellent one. You know, that sounds like something to be a lot of fun for other people too. Uh, mm -hmm. not maybe, maybe candy or maybe something else, you know, yep. maybe other trinkets that you might bring along. Yeah, absolutely. And I know one of the reasons that we're here today is to talk about training for adults. And everyone, you have to look at these people who are with me today, Patricia, who has spent years many in the years. corporate world. <laughs> Not as many as you. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> has spent years in the corporate world working with you know, HR on that side of things and how to get your, the emotional side of you and get it paired up with the corporate side of you and how to be yourself and how to love yourself and how to excel at what you do. And Craig, Craig is just an amazing, just an amazing person who has all sorts of training that he's created from PMP to Lean Six Sigma to how to, how to train your group to do customer service. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So we have been giving you tidbits of information over these podcasts, and we wanted to let you know that there are formal ways to train you. Craig has training that he can expand on, and so does Patricia. And we think that you need to hear this because if you like our approach to learning, then you'll love the courses that we have to offer. So I don't know which one of you wants to start first, but I'm turning well, it over to you. Let's just ask each other a bunch of questions because we'll we'll use this as kind of an introduction. I, I, I brought out of my bookshelf, I got a bunch of books like this. This is icebreakers, right? <laughs> and so I started with icebreakers, not because I wanted to go through and look at uh, specific icebreakers out of this book, but I was just wanted to show you there are lots of resources for icebreakers and for other things. And we have and I have other books on games for, for training and all that. So if you're really interested in 
beefing up your training department, then there's all kinds of resources out there. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask just uh, some random questions and Ann, you think of random questions and Patricia, you think of random questions. And the first thing that comes to mind is what was your most embarrassing moment as an instructor or as a teacher related to just training adults? And I'll start off. So probably there's been a couple, but probably one of them was when you're up in front of a group of people, first, first time I noticed this was as a graduate assistant teaching uh, engineering management. No, it's engineering economy in a class. And so there's a whole bunch of students there. And I went up and I, um, I was trying to show them how to do a specific thing that I knew backwards and forwards, but I got up in front of this group and I started writing it on the board and I, I just lost all consciousness about what was the next step. And everybody's hanging on my every word and there's at least 30 people in this class and they're all about my age, which made it worse, right? And so, um, but uh, so that was that was one, and I had to go. I had to go out of that big frame of the whiteboard, or probably blackboard then, but the whiteboard, and I had to go to my uh, podium, and I had to work it out where to myself before I could go back to the uh, board, and that was so embarrassing to me. That was my, one of my early first experiences. But how do you handle something like that? And and I'm gonna ask you. Patricia, if you have any, but how do you suggest that people handle something like that when you just draw a blank on the next thing you're supposed to do? I just say life happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I just, um, I think to not try to, uh, this would be my approach, is to not try to cover up, to say, you know what, I totally lost my thought. And, um, but here's something else that came to me, and I'd like to share this. And then maybe it'll bring us back on target. I've had those kind of moments too. Somebody may ask a question and it throws me off of the, the direction I was going. And I think the best thing we can do as trainers is be human and not act like we've got all the answers. Because I think this is where we've been in the past that everybody sees trainers, consultants, leaders as God. That is not true. We all are human beings first. And unless we start to act like that, we will never be impactful in our training. Okay, it's probably more than you wanted. That's all right. That's all right. Let's, let's see. I think since then, that experience has led me to overdevelop, you know, so that I have, if I have an hour's worth of training to do, I have two hours worth of stuff I can cover. So if I, if something gets off target or someone asks a question, then I usually have that prepared too. So preparing has helped me, but you know, I have a funny story. It went along with that day. I just thought about it. So that day I passed out some, some kind of homework assignment and people were supposed to, or it might've been a form or I can't remember, but some, some, I was passing out forms and then uh, as they got to the end, they would pass back the ones that were left over, right? And so one came back and it had some kind of note on the back of it and I didn't pay attention to it. I just kind of remember in my subconscious, right? I flipped it over and I passed it out down another row. After class, there were two young girls about my age that were sitting there waiting. And so I, I, I didn't know, I, I said, uh, is there anything I, uh, did you have a question or something? And then one girl got up and she said, no, I think, I think uh, you answered it or something. And she walked out and the other girl said, uh, did you send me this note? I said, what yeah. note? And so the one girl sent me a note and I sent it to another girl in the class. <laughs> and oh. it was something like, something like, let's go eat lunch afterwards or something like that. It was some kind of, you know, some kind of little note like that. So that was my presentation probably didn't go as bad as I thought it did <laughs> because I thought that was, uh, I remember that. And that was, I, it was like, it wasn't until after that that I don't even know if I, I 
probably read the note or not, but I figured it out that, oh, I just sent this note from that person to that person. They're both there. So that was the second most embarrassing thing to happen. <laughs> happened. But I thought, I always remember that, thought it was really interesting. But anyway, all right. So is there any other embarrassing moments? What about some time? How, how about a heckler? How about somebody is trying to embarrass you? Have you had I, any? I, can I share something about? Yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you said that one of the things is preparation. One of the most two, I can think of two situations where I, I was out east at a personal growth workshop. And I remember there were about 25 of us in the room. We sat there and sat there and sat there and nobody showed up, no leader or anything, nobody. Mm -hmm. This was a personal growth. And here's what ended up happening. We started talking to one another and said, you know what? Let's just make this impactful. What, is, what do you want to learn? What, a, what would be helpful to you? So we started the meeting ourselves as the participants. And about 25 minutes later, the leader came in. It was probably the most um, personal growth kind of moment that we could have. We were waiting for somebody to tell us how to do it or how to start or how to get involved or how to speak to one another or what it was about. And we took action. That's what we need to be doing. And then one more, uh, and then I promise, and it's your turn. <laughs> but another one, I was at an International Coaches Federation meeting here in Nashville, Tennessee. And we had a speaker that day, which we did each time at the lunch. She got up in front and she had a flip chart. And she stood by her flip chart and she looked at all of us and she said, I have nothing planned for today. It's going to evolve. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was, it was just like, we think we know what people need. No, we don't. They know what they need half of the time. And all we need is somebody over here to say, yeah, I got that same problem. So I think training for adults is making a major shift. And I can speak about that later. Okay, Ann, what's yours? <laughs> Again, my whole group is kids. So it comes a little differently with how I do things. And I don't know that I can think of a real embarrassing moment because when you're around kids, everything is almost a free for all to a large degree. And if you don't want to curb their creativity, you got to let them, let them get it out and let them participate. And you just try to manage as best you can. Because that's one thing that I always wanted to make sure is that the children who are shy have as much say as those who can be overpowering at times. Yes. So I'll give you a situation where we put them together. And th this is really funny. We have a, an activity that we do at one of the events that I do. And the kids have to get together and they have to make a zoo animal. And they're given newspaper and sticky labels. They're put in groups of roughly five children in each group. They cannot speak to each other while they're doing this. They each have to create a part of an animal or a bird or some creature. So it could be a leg, it could be a trunk, it could be a tail, it could be the body, it could be whatever. Then they're looking at each other and they're all trying to create something where they think they're gonna be putting them together. And then what I do is I upset the whole apple cart and I tell them to put their part of the animal into a paper bag and then I move them to another table. So now they have this piece that they thought was gonna fit the animal that they were all working on at their table and now they're going to another table. Well, some of these kids at another table, now that they're there, they all take their part out of the bag and some had five legs at the table. <laughs> so now they had to build an animal with five legs and they still couldn't speak. 
So they were working together and then they had a sheet at the end. I gave them two minutes. They had to decide, uh, they had a habitat that they were assigned to. So it could have been an Arctic creature, it could have been a creature from the savannas or the desert or the ocean. Then they had to give their creature a name. They had to give it three characteristics. They had to say what kind of food it ate. They had to say what scared it. And they had to work as a team. And then they had to take that animal that they put together, whatever it looked like, and they had to present it to the zookeeper and try to convince the zookeeper to put it in the zoo. That in itself is a team building activity. It yes. gets them, even though they can't speak to each other, they some of these kids got very, very creative in how they communicated with each other. And that's what I wanted to bring to them is that you all have different pieces and parts that you bring to the table, but now you got to work together to make things happen. And you have to build off each other and learn from each other. And then you all have to cooperate when you go to the zookeeper to get the zookeeper to put your animal in the zoo. Wow. So. So, Anne, your stuff is better than our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your opinion. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm judging, you know. <laughs> so, let's see. Well, now, that see, that leads me to think of a whole different line. Okay, so now we're really thinking about examples like Anne gave and games and, mm -hmm. and just other things. Uh, uh, Patricia, you think of one, and I'm going to give one that I thought was pretty good. So related to the games, uh, one of the things that I taught a lot was project management. So project management, I taught with the American Management Association, Paget Thompson, I taught to the uh, University of Phoenix, uh, University of Tennessee, Belmont University, uh, uh, Vanderbilt University, and a whole bunch of other places for the PMI, Project Management Institute. And so I have a lot of experience in project management teaching. And, and, and one of the games that I thought was really interesting that AMA, the American Management Association uh, introduced to me was uh, putting uh, the teams together on a different tables, maybe five, six people on each table. And then they would give them a whole bunch of parts and this, these parts would be uh, connecting, you know, some kind of, they're not Legos, but they're, I can't remember the name of the thing, but it's like uh, just parts that connect together and you play, you play with the kids play with it. And so then they uh, would give each group a little baggie of the same parts and they would say, all right, you can't explain what you're doing. You can't plan anything out, but I want you to build a helicopter. You know, and so each group would build a helicopter and then I would pick it up and I'd test it. I'm going to test it on a couple of things. I'm going to test it on whether the parts are cheap, whether it's an inexpensive. I'm going to look at the cost it takes to build this. And so the longer parts are more expensive than the shorter parts and the more complicated parts are more expensive than the less complicated parts. And and so if you use more parts, it's gonna cost more, right? And so then I'm gonna give it a quality test. I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna shake it. And if it falls apart, you know, the quality's bad. And I had a couple other tests I would do. But, it, but that was a good way to get people involved in just doing teamwork without being able to plan out something. And the lesson there, there's always gotta be a so what when it comes to adults. So why are we doing this? How can I use it in the future? And other things. So the so what was just the, the importance of planning. So we'd go that before we went into the planning and everything else. Because these parts, when we started, no one's ever seen these parts before. No one's ever seen that game before. No one's ever seen, played with that before. It's brand new when we started using it. So uh, just knowing how it fits together was a chore. So they would go in and before they could touch it, they would, well, come to think of, there was planning because before they could touch the parts, they had to actually decide what they're going to do. So that was all the planning they had, right? And so it, it, was, uh, it, it was something that, um, it, it was just something that a game that broke up the overall progression of the different technical stuff and made something fun that mm -hmm. you could do. Patricia, do you have an example? Um, I was thinking about, I, I do 
my training in corporate America is more focused on the soul of the person, the way they think, the way they behave, getting in touch with themselves, in, uh, not instead of, but it's just more focused there on who are you and how do you work and what do you do? So you were sharing a team exercise. And so I'll share a team. I've done different things with leaders too, but this was a team exercise I did. They were struggling to get along as a team in this organization. And um, so I'm not much about giving instructions about here's what we're going to do. I let it evolve. So um, it is a different way to train, I guess. But um, so I took um, oil, not oil, acrylic paints, paint brushes, and two canvases to this organization. And I divided the group. There were, um, I think there were 20 some people. I divided them in two groups. And I said, here's what I want you to do. Here's a canvas, here's some paints. So create an artistic piece. With 10 people. Yeah, that, that's right. Mm -hmm. And they each had their own paintbrush. And we had the palette there. But here's what happened after that. They, it was tough getting started because they didn't know, they always wait for somebody else to be the leader or for the person that's most vocal to step in. And um, so they sat there for a while. I didn't say a thing, I just observed. And um, they, they had two separate tables and I didn't say a thing. And finally, somebody picked up a brush. And then they all picked up a brush and then dipped in the, so, the whole process was they started creating something they had no idea what it was going to be in the beginning. However, somebody added a tree. You could paint whatever you wanted to in this picture. It did not matter. Somebody made an umbrella. Somebody made a bicycle. I mean, some of the things, it was just unbelievable. They had 35 minutes to do this in. And then when we got done, we talked about what did it take to work as a team here, working as a team? What did it take to accomplish this task? And what do you think you have said in your, your painting here about teamwork? I'm telling you, it was it was just us in human dynamics, all trying to say, well, I want to look good. Oh, I'm not a painter. They were all saying these things afterwards. I'm not really that good. Well, I've never painted. And I said, well, what did you find out about yourself in that? Well, you we yeah. So, you know, it was like they were discovering things that they could do that they'd never thought. They always waited for somebody else. Oh, he's the artist, she's the, but they just jumped in. And this is true. The painting is on, the paintings are on the wall in that company as a reminder, we're here to work as a team. Yep. And that yeah. is, that's a true story. Very good. And so I think, um, I always get a call about this time. So I, I think, <laughs> that uh, one of the things that people should know, uh, Patricia, is the kind of things that you are normally called into a company to do. And so mm -hmm. I know very little, I know how we work together. We work together anytime there's an HR component and, yes. and I'm, I'm looking at that, anytime there's a human component. Uh, but also I've noted that you have been called into companies that are going through downsizing and to help the, people who are gonna to have to leave the company to, to feel good about themselves and yeah. to find their next steps in life and those kind of things. And that's very valuable. So yeah. what you just pictured was a demonstration of that, you know? And so um, you wanna to add to it? You wanna give us a little bit more about the kind of things that you normally do? I know you have a woman, woman show that's really entertaining too. 
Yeah, but it's really about life. It's uh, more about transition, making a transition in life. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like a change thing, mentor, right? Yes, it's like, it, that's exactly right. Finding out in midlife or in late life who I really am and starting to live again. But from a career standpoint, you're so right. I, I was talking to a client the other day and I said, tell the company what you want. They don't know what to say, but what happens a lot of times is the coaching in corporate America is simply about an individual getting to know who they are, first of all, because you cannot interview well unless you know who you are and have confidence like the people that thought they couldn't paint or they thought they couldn't uh, work as a team. And there they were working as a team. But to find who you are, number one, and then to find what your talents are. And that's what I helped them do. They said, well, I didn't call that uh, consulting. I didn't call that. They don't have the words for it. So language is a real issue for people uh, Number one, saying what they want. And number two, putting it in a resume. And number three, identifying it as a real um, opportunity to contribute to a company. So it's just like a wake up call. And you know what? This is going to sound terrible, but some of the best gifts in life is when somebody faces a big disappointment, like losing their job. Yeah and finding out who they really are and what they have to offer. It's sad, but that is true. We don't know who we are. Somebody's always told us, or we've followed everybody's path. And that's what, it, I love what Ann said. Those children, we are just children in big bodies to tell you the truth. <laughs> In corporate America, too. And that's why I've done most of my work. And you all both know that, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Andy, would you like to tell a little bit about your background training children? And I know we said training adults, but you've already shown us that it really applies both ways in some, yes. in some cases. Well, the way I approach things is I usually do events for children. Um, and I take different components and values and we try to do fun activities around those. So the kids are entertained or, and learning at the same time. I call it entertaining yeah. because it's uh, entertaining them as they're learning. And we do this on a weekend. So it becomes something special to each of these children it's not just a class that they're going to yes they're going to something that they don't normally go to in order to learn we try to give them uh, meals and snacks which kids all love we try to have components where they have some physical activities so that they can let out some of their energy and then we invite women across um, the state to come in and be part of this training. So these girls have access to uh, women who ha are, have come from various backgrounds who are doing different things. And we have a special activity, it's called our change activity. And it's a luncheon where the girls sit at a table with one or two women and they have to guess what these women do. And we have pictures of these women when they were children, like these girls. And these girls see that they're, these women looked like them when they were young. Mm -hmm. And now these women are doing all these different things from being a farmer to being the secretary of state to being a baker or an entrepreneur yes. or a, you know, an actor. They learn that anything that they want to do they can do and they also learn that these women have changed over the years and started in one area and changed direction so that whole activity is all about change yep. yes so it looks like we have a little over a minute left so i'm going to close this off i guess my background is more 
technical in nature. I'm an engineer, so usually I'm called in to do technical things. But I have a human aspect that I really approach because it's yes. interwoven throughout everything you do. There's culture and people and motivational theories that are connected with every everything you do. And so I would be called in to do things like project management, blueprint reading. I remember I wasn't prepared to do that because I had had that class before, but you know I wasn't prepared to do that. And then uh, even customer focus and and all kinds of things. And, and usually being an artist too, I try to use the visual side of everything. It, it was really hard for me to go through and learn some of these things. So I bring with it, you know, a smaller step-by-step -step approach in order to master it. And I think we're out of time totally. So I'm gonna say goodbye. Patricia, say goodbye. Bye. goodbye. Thank you all. Yeah. all right. Thank you. Hope we added something of value.